we are we are going to uh, prepare for communion, and I want to direct your attention to a passage in the book of Job. So if you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Job, chapter 33. And if, if you don't have a Bible, we have some Bibles available here. Jerry has uh, some. So if you don't have a Bible, just, just throw up your hand. He'll come to you and get you a copy so that you can follow along. And I want to direct our attention to this incredible text. It's, it's one of my favorites uh, in the Old Testament. We should notice when we look at this text we should notice that this is the earliest written account of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. This is the earliest inspired writing of imputation of faith. Of course, Genesis 15:6 and 15:4, that, that whole passage with Abraham happened before this account. But then Moses wrote about it much after, and this being the earliest Old Testament book, this, is, this becomes the first inspired account of man's need for divine righteousness given to him. And so this is one of my favorite texts for that very reason. We're, um, we're in a text where, if you're familiar with the book of Job, you know, Job suffered tremendously. He he suffered, and um, he suffered quite a bit because of God's providence and the trials that he experienced. And then as you read chapters 3 through 32, he suffered quite a bit at the hands of his friends. Uh, who needs enemies when you've got friends like that? Uh, they counseled him. They, they helped him, and they encouraged him. And if you have read the book of, of Job, you remember there were three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and they all counsel him with their competing worldviews. Eliphaz was empiricist. He kind of just basically says, Job, you need to trust your own experience. You need to look at your experience, and, and um, you need to rely on your experience. And Bildad was a humanist. He just says, trust in your own goodness. And, and in fact, the reason why you're suffering, Job, is you must not have the goodness that you thought you had. You just got exposed. Zophar was the uh, rationalist, and he basically tells Job to trust in his own understanding. And they all basically agree, even though they come at it from different angles philosophically, they all basically agree, Job, you're experiencing such a miserable life because of your own doing. And um, so you just need to fess up and admit that you have sinned. And he continues to maintain his integrity. And he does not sin in maintaining his integrity, nor does he sin in ascribing the trial to God's hand. He didn't sin because God actually did bring the trial his way. He starts to sin as early as Job 9, and especially in Job 10 and Job 19. He starts to explain with his fist up to heaven, because I am living a righteous life and I'm trying to follow you, there is no reason for my suffering. And that's where he sins. So now we're fast forwarding all the way to Job 32 when Elihu steps in. And in Job 32, Elihu was frustrated with Job because he justified himself before God. And his, his anger burned against the three friends because they had no answer but kept condemning him. And that's just described at the very beginning of chapter, chapter 32, verses 1 through 3. And then in verse 4 says he waited to speak. And so then he goes on to give the only sound counsel in the book up to this point. And I want to fast forward to Genesis, Job 33, verse 23. And since this is just going to be a quick meditation, I'm going to appeal to what we've done together as a church. And so corporately, in our study of Mark, we did some study in the Old Testament about the angel, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, the messenger of the covenant. Here it is again. Elihu knows about this individual. It's a divine individual. It's a divine individual who promises to become the fulfillment of the seed promise. And Elihu knows about him. And this is what he says in Job 33, verse 23. Oh, actually, go back to, I'm sorry, let me back up to verse 19. Man is also chastened with pain on his bed, with unceasing complaint in his bones, so that his life loathes bread, and his soul favorite food. His flesh wastes away from sight, and his bones, which were not seen, stick out. Then his soul draws near to the pit, and his life to those who bring death. Elihu summarizes a Job-like experience saying that, you know what, God does this quite often. He brings us to suffering 
to bring us close to death, to bring us outside of ourself, to see our true need. And in that context, in the context of suffering, in the context of asking ultimate questions, that's where this really becomes an answer. And this is why this is so helpful for us in communion. Now he says in verse 23, if there was an angel, that's the word angel slash messenger, if there was a messenger as a, as a mediator for him, one out of a thousand, to remind a man what is right for him, or as the literal Hebrew has, to remind him, to recall to mind and to demonstrate to him what is his righteousness. And the question then becomes, whose righteousness? Man's or God's? Well, that becomes, the, that becomes clearer in the remainder of this text. If only we could find a messenger to go between God and man who could declare to man his righteousness. Verse 24, then let him be gracious to him. Let the messenger be gracious to him and say, so listen, this mediator now between God and man is declaring Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. And if you're, I'm appealing to a lot of, a lot of preaching from Mark, but if you weren't here for Mark, just know that the angel is the pre-incarnate Christ. We can prove that from Genesis and Exodus and Isaiah and Malachi. And here Elihu is recording, if only there was we could find this mediator who could declare to God about the man who has drawn near to death in his suffering, deliver him from going down because I have found a ransom for him. Verse 25, speaking of that man, let his flesh become fresher than in youth. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then he will pray to God. So now the man who drew near to death, who drew near to the pit, who is lacking righteousness, he will pray to God. He will cry out to God. God will accept him that he may see his face, that's God's face, with joy, and he may restore his righteousness to man. Wow. Elihu was onto something. Christian, you think about it this morning. Your sufferings and your trials, some of our sufferings and trials are self-inflicted. Jeremiah 2.12 says so. Didn't you bring these things on yourself? Some of them are just in God's wisdom and his gracious provision. Just like Paul says in Philippians, to you it has been granted to believe and also to suffer. But either way, your suffering should be reminding you of your absolute need for divine righteousness. In verse 26, it's talking about God restoring his own righteousness, capital H-I-S there, is absolutely correct. This is God's righteousness being restored to man who does not have it. What happens when man who has divine righteousness given to him? Verse 27, he will sing to men and say, I have sinned and perverted what is right, and it is not proper for me. He has redeemed my soul from going to the pit, and my life shall see the light. What light? Verse 29, Behold, God does all these oftentimes with men to bring back his soul from the pit that he may be enlightened with the light of life. It's the light of life. Believer, think about this in the context of communion and think about this in the context of your sufferings and your experience. Do not forget that God often does this with us. He brings us to the point of our weakness, brings us to the point of despair, in inward turmoil, external constraint, external temptation or trial whether self-imposed or not, to remind us of what we need. We need a mediator. We need Jesus Christ, the God-man. There is only one mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man Jesus Christ. And when we have righteousness given to us, what's our response? We start, we start singing to one another and say, we've fouled it up. We have messed it up bad. But boy, do we have somebody to boast in. He has redeemed my soul from going to the pit, and my life shall see the light. This text might have been written, might have been written, we don't know, might have been written, sorry, I had to do some math, 5,600 years ago. 
Fast forward a couple millennia. And this mediator, who has always existed and is a divine person, took on humanity and died on a cross and rose from the dead so that this verse would be true. He can say, I have found a ransom. Christ is our ransom. Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the only way sinners can have divine righteousness given to them. Believers, that's obviously what we're declaring and that's what we're remembering by taking the Lord's Supper this morning. I want to uh, just let you know, if you're, if you're not a believer, if you're not in Christ, I'm so glad you're here and I'm glad that you can even think about those truths and even think about this very text in Job 33, the first declaration of imputation of divine righteousness. That's your need. And I would also ask you to not partake of the Lord's Supper because it's communion. It's, you're, you're communing. You're sharing in the effects of Christ's shed blood. Uh, nobody's declaring that we're perfect. Nobody's declaring that we even have merit. We're declaring that we have been purchased and atoned for, that our souls have been ransomed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're sharing in this morning. So I'm going to ask the men to come forward.